Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Welcome to uh, episode 113 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things important to me. I think deserve your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, you can contact me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and you can get the email address from there, or you can comment there if you like. All right, with those uh, typical introductions, um, let me get right to it. I actually have three good news items to start this week. I always like to start with good news when I can. And all three of these come from a very unexpected source, the United States Supreme Court. On June 13th, the court ruled unanimously in, in a suit brought by the Association for Molecular Pathology that companies cannot patent naturally occurring human genes. That reverses like three decades of government, uh, government uh, official actions. The opinion was written by Clarence Thomas, who wrote that patents held by an outfit called Myriad Genetics, uh, patents holding on an increasingly popular breast cancer test, are, in, are invalid because they violate patent rules. The court has previously said that um, laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas are not patentable. These are standards that have long been ignored by the U.S. Patent Office. Well, in this case, the Myriad Company had claimed a patent on two specific genes to come up with its uh, BRAC analysis test, which looks for mutations in the breast cancer predisposition gene, or BRCA. Uh, these genes, uh, mutations on these genes are linked to a great increased, uh, greatly increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Myriad says the only BRCA gene test available because it uses its patent on the genes to prevent any other company from working with the genes to develop different tests. The court ruled that, quoting, a naturally occurring DNA segment is a product of nature and not patent eligible merely because it has been isolated. Now, all the chicken little, littles who say that uh, research will collapse if companies are unable to patent you know, genes and plants and other natural phenomena, well, those people are either foolish or they're corporate shills. For one thing, the court also ruled that synthetic DNA, which is known as complementary DNA or cDNA, uh, can be patented because it is not naturally occurring. That is, it doesn't exist in nature. And as Thomas pointed out, there are still ways for Myriad to make money off its discovery. For one example, it could apply for a method patent on the particular way that its test works. The point is you just can't patent nature. And that's good news. There's actually an amusing, or well, in this case, it, it's sort of amusing, because in this case it, it is amusing, but it could have implications elsewhere. But there is a sort of amusing footnote. Justice Antonin Scalia uh, voted with the majority, but wrote his own concurring opinion because he wanted to make it clear that he didn't agree with parts of Thomas's opinion. He said, quoting, I join the judgment of the court in all of its opinion except part 1A and some portions of the rest because, he said, I am unable to affirm these details on my own knowledge or even my own belief. Well, what's section 1A? That's the part where Thomas recited the basic fundamentals of molecular biology. This is stuff any first-year college student or maybe any high school senior would have to know in order to pass a biology, cl uh, biology class. This is stuff, however, that Scalia is unable to affirm on my own knowledge or belief. Apparently, Antonin Scalia doesn't believe in genes. All right, another bit of good news coming out of the court this week came on Monday. By a vote of 7 to 2, the justices ruled that states cannot demand proof of citizenship from people registering to vote in federal elections unless they get federal court approval to do so. The issue is that uh, of the federal form used for the federal motor registration law, uh, and in striking down an Arizona law on this, Justice Antonin Scalia What's the world coming to? Uh, Justice Anson, Antonin Scalia said, federal law precludes Arizona from requiring a federal form applicant to submit information beyond that required by the form itself. In other words, to do that, to demand that extra information, the state would either have to get approval from the uh, Federal Election Assistance Commission or to get a federal court to overrule an adverse decision by that commission. 
Now, this decision by the court was a clear slap in the face of the Arizona extremists and the reactionaries, who, despite their orchestrated whines about voter fraud, seem to be a lot more afraid of brown skin than busted ballots. However, there is a however, the state can still demand this extra information uh, from anyone who registers through state offices rather than the federal form. And in fact, uh, officials in Arizona now say they will ask the, ele the Election Assistance Commission for permission to demand this extra uh, information on the federal form. And if they're denied, they're going to go to court to try to get the court to rule it. Now, that's the process that the Supreme Court just laid out to do this. And Arizona Attorney General Tom Horn called that a clear path to victory for the people of Arizona. Funny thing is, I think the people of Arizona are the ones who just won. All right, the third one. This is the case that got the least attention in the news, but it could, could have a real impact on the cost of medications for Americans. Now, the big pharmaceutical companies have become notorious for manipulating patent laws, we're talking about patent laws again, uh, to, for the purpose of keeping their greedy hands in our pockets. Patents on drugs usually last for 20 years. But um, Big Pharma has often succeeded on getting patents renewed by claiming a new use for that same drug, uh, which thus extends their monopoly, or getting a patent on a new drug, which is actually nothing but a minor reformulation of an old one. Generic drug makers sometimes challenge these patents in court. Uh, now, if a patent succeed, a challenge succeeded, it could mean a generic version of this drug could be brought to market years before it otherwise would. The brand name makers usually respond by suing the generic maker. So the companies reach a compromise where the brand name maker pays the generic maker a sometimes hefty settlement in exchange for agreeing to keep the generic form of the drug off the market for some specified number of years. The overall effect of this is that the extremely overpriced brand name drugs for which there is no generic alternative continue to be big, big, big profit centers for big pharma and big drains on our budgets, especially for seniors. Drug companies had wanted the Supreme Court to immunize these agreements against antitrust claims. By a vote of five to three, the court said no. The ruling said that, quoting, precedents make clear that patent-related settlement agreements can sometimes violate antitrust law, which would make them illegal. Now, the court resisted motions to make all of these so-called reverse patent payments, or reverse payout settlements, rather, or pay for delay, as they're sometimes called, uh, resisted uh, moves to make all of these illegal, but it did say they can be challenged as a violation of antitrust laws. Um, and since the, inv the invariable result of these agreements is to guarantee a delay in getting a generic drug to the market, court's action is good news. Now, to keep us in a good mood, I've got a couple of things. I've got two feel-good stories, both of which involve poking a stick in the eye of the bigots. Now, the first one, I know you heard about this. How could you not have heard about this? But um, I wanted to mention it anyway. Before Game 3 of the NBA Finals in San Antonio between the Spurs and the Miami Heat, an 11-year-old mariachi singer named Sebastian De La Cruz performed the national anthem. This set off a flood of racist tweets, which included calling him a beaner and a wetback who just snuck into the country four hours ago, who was singing the Mexican hat dance, and people were demanding to know why this Mexican kid, who by the way was born and has lived all his life in San Antonio, why he was singing our anthem. The response by the San Antonio Spurs? They had him come back and do it again before game four which he did to a, an ovation and loud cheers. And that, frankly, I think, class act Spurs, and as well as the fans and De La Cruz himself. So like I said, I know you heard about this, but I still wanted to mention it. The feel-good story you may not have heard about, however, comes from Topeka, Kansas. Back in March, I mentioned the house that's directly across the street from the compound of the racist, bigoted Westboro back 
Baptist Church. Uh, I mentioned that house is being painted in the rainbow colors of gay pride. It's called the Equality House, and it's maintained by a group called Planting Peace, which campaigns for human rights, gay rights, and anti-bullying efforts. Well, last week, five-year-old Jaden Sink of Kansas City decided to set up a pink lemonade stand in front of the house. This is after her parents explained to her what that house actually meant. She put up a sign saying, Pink Lemonade for Peace, $1 suggested donation. Supporters came by in droves, and a dollar turned into hundreds. By the end of the day, she had $400 in cash, plus another $1,000 pledged through an online campaign, which had swollen to $16,000 by Tuesday. All the money is going to planting peace. Now, the bigots in the compound across the street try to shut her down. They try to have the police called in, all this stuff. They failed. So, like the losers they are, they resorted to sh yelling profanities, shouting profanities at those who stopped by, and later putting up a sign with an anti-gay slur on it. The mighty, mighty God is on our side, Westboro Baptist Church, left fuming and frustrated by a five-year-old girl. That is good news. All right, one last thing. Uh, before we go to break, this is sort of a, uh, well, you know, I don't know. It's a, let's put it this way. Uh, Pierre uh, Beaumarchais, he is actually the man who wrote the play versions of The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro. He once wrote that, quoting, I hasten to laugh at everything for fear of being obliged to weep. And I have to tell you, I often feel the same way. Uh, here's one example. Robert Zimmerman, now he's George Zimmerman's father, and George Zimmerman, in case you've forgotten, is the man now on trial for murder for having killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Well, Robert Zimmerman, the father, has released an e-book called Florida v. Zimmerman, Uncovering the Malicious Prosecution of My Son George. It's his views on the how and why of the case. He loudly declares that racism had absolutely nothing to do with what happened, that his son is in no way a racist. In fact, he actually said that some of his son's best friends are African American. In fact, he thinks the racist, oh, and by the way, um, uh, he said that until this case, he actually thought racism was a thing of the past. Uh, apparently, he had never come across this or this, or this, or this. But he claims the racism in this case is coming from somewhere else. And he devotes an entire chapter of his book called Who Are the Real Racists to answering that question. So who are the true racists according to Robert Zimmerman? Uh, Robert Zimmerman? For one, the Congressional Black Caucus, which he calls a pathetic self-serving group of racists advancing their purely racist agenda. The NAACP, which he says simply promotes racism and hatred for their own prim uh, primarily financial interest because without prejudice and racial divide, the NAACP would cease to exist. NAACP President Benjamin Jealous was labeled what I would expect of a racist. Even Trayvon Martin's funeral director got dragged into this list. He called him a racial activist. Others on his list of true racists include the National Basketball Players Association, the Black Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, the National Black United Fund, and the United Negro College Fund. Are you seeing a pattern here? Now, while he doesn't outright call Barack Obama a racist, he does claim that he has shamelessly sought to exploit the case to gain great advantage in the African American community. And to use a wonderful old phrase, to cap the climax. Zimmerman says that because of Eric Holder's politically motivated decision, he says, to investigate whether Trayvon Martin's death violated federal civil rights laws, the FBI did not have, quoting, adequate resources to investigate clearly identified potential terrorists in the Boston area. Oh, that's right. George, uh, uh, Robert Zimmerman is blaming the Boston Marathon bombings on the investigation of his son. And the laughs just keep on coming. We're taking a break. And here we are back again uh, from our very quick break. Uh, we're going to actually plunge right back in. We're going to start with one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award. 
This week, the, big, the winner of the Big Red Nose is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, or as he is also known, Dr. Evil. He told Politico uh, last week that when people are gloomy about the economy, uh, they get scared and that can hold back economic growth. The culture of America has gotten too negative, he said. Sentiment matters. In other words, what's wrong with the economy? What's keeping it from growing the way it should? You, you're not happy enough. The U.S. is currently in its weakest recovery since World War II. The unemployment rate is still above pre-recession levels, and the jobs that are being created are mostly low-paying. 60% of the jobs lost in the recession were middle-wage jobs. 58% of the jobs gained in the so-called recovery are low-wage jobs. About a third of working families in the United States now, covering about 47 million people, are working at low-wage jobs today. But the problem is, you're not happy enough. Hourly pay has grown just by an average of 2% a year over the last four years. That's the weakest four-year stretch on record, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In fact, also according to the BLS, hourly pay for non-farm workers actually shrank at an annualized rate of 3.8% in the first quarter of 2013, the biggest quarterly drop on record. But the problem is, you're not happy enough. The unemployment rate for African Americans was 13.5%. The U6 unemployment rate, which includes both people who are unemployed and working part-time because they can't find anything better, is 13.8%. And the number of long-term unemployed, people who have been unemployed for 27 weeks or longer, is at 4.4 million. The percentage of people working part-time now is still higher than it was before the recession started. Nearly 19% of the workforce is part-time. The economy is still 2.4 million jobs short of where it was in January of 2008. And at the current pace of job growth, the economy will not be back to anything that might be considered full employment before 2021. But the problem is you're not happy enough. Meanwhile, corporate profits are at an all-time high, which I'm sure makes Lloyd Blankfein, who made $26 million last year, heading a company that only still exists because of a $10 billion taxpayer bailout in 2008, I'm sure it makes him very happy indeed. He's still a clown. A happy clown, but still a clown. All right, moving on from there to our other regular weekly feature. I had some good news from the Supreme Court this week. So it's only right that the court gets returned to the place we usually find it. This is the outrage of the week. Now, you know about the Miranda warning, the one the cops on every TV show read out starting with, you have the right to remain silent. It's drawn from a 1966 Supreme Court decision based on the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. What you likely don't know is how many loopholes, limitations, and exceptions to that rule the court has created in the years since. Now it's come up with one of the worst. Part of the rule is that prosecutors can't use a defendant's silence against them in court. Exercising your right to remain silent is just that, your right. And just as a jury is not allowed to use your the fact that you didn't testify on your own behalf as some evidence of your guilt, so too prosecutors are not supposed to be allowed to point to your silence as evidence of your guilt. Now, however, the Supreme Court says that prosecutors can use a person's silence against them if it comes before they were told of their right to remain silent. The case is that of Genevieve Salinas. He was convicted of a 1992 murder. While he was being questioned by police, but before he was arrested, uh, so which means before he was read his Miranda rights, Salinas answered some questions but wouldn't answer others. In fact, one that he didn't answer was if a shotgun to which he had access would match up with the murder weapon, which is kind of a have you stop beating your wife kind of question, but leave that aside. Prosecutors in Texas used his silence on that question to help convince the jury of his guilt. Salinas appealed, saying his Fifth Amendment right against, uh, to stay silent should have kept the prosecution from using his silence against him in court. Prosecutors, on the other hand, argued that Salinas, since Salinas had answered some questions but hadn't answered others, and that he wasn't under arrest and so wasn't compelled to speak, his silence on the incriminating question doesn't get constitutional protection. 
Texas courts agreed with the prosecutor saying pre-Miranda silence is not constitutionally protected. The Supreme Court has now upheld that decision by the predictable and usual ideological five to four split. Now the logic of the decision, if you can even use that word here, the logic of the decision, which was written by Sam Alito, is that Salinas says, I'm quoting here, Fifth Amendment claim fails because he did not expressly invoke the privilege against self-incrimination in response to the officer's question. In other words, because he remained silent and didn't answer the question, rather than saying something like, I am invoking my constitutional rights under the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination, um, prosecutors were justified in claiming that his silence was an effective admission of guilt. Now remember, this, a this refers to a question that was asked by cop before he was arrested, so before he was informed of his Miranda rights. Which means the court has actually argued that prior to an actual arrest, anything you say or don't say can be used against you unless you specifically and in so many words invoke your rights to remain silent, rights that you're not expected to know about, which is why the cops have to tell you about them when they arrest you. This decision is the product of diseased minds that are prepared to twist logic and law into whatever shape necessary to be able to say cops and prosecutors win. And it is an outrage. Now last week I said I was going to talk more about the um, intelligence things, the surveillance stuff. Uh, and I am, but I'm going to start actually by giving out a hero award. The Hero Award is going to Edward Snowden. He's the 29-year-old former technical advisor to the CIA and former employee of the defense contractor Booz Allen Hamilton. He is, as I expect you know, the individual who's responsible for the uh, information about the telephone surveillance, one of the most significant leaks in U.S. political history. In a note accompanying the first set of documents he provided to The Guardian, which is a leading newspaper in the United Kingdom, he wrote, I quote, I understand that I will be made to suffer from my actions, but, quoting, I will be satisfied if the Federation of Secret Law, Unequal Pardon, and Irresistible Executive Powers that rule the world I love are revealed even for an instant. In a subsequent interview with The Guardian, he said he just doesn't fear the consequences of going public, only that doing so will distract attention from the issues that are actually raised by the revelations. I know the media likes to personalize political debates, he said, and I know that the government will demonize me, both of which have come true as pundits delight in pop psychology speculation and government flax try desperately to change the, change the question from the leaks to the leaker. As for Snowden, he said, quote, I feel satisfied that this was all worth it. I have no regrets. Those are the words of a hero. All right. So going on then to um, our discussion about the, about the surveillance. Snowden was responsible uh, as, again, for the information about the massive phone surveillance. That's the sweeping up of data about millions of phone calls a day. And will everyone please stop with the crap that they only know what number called what number in the day and time and they don't know the persons who made the call because if you know the number, you know the person. Don't be an idiot. Haven't you ever heard of a reverse lookup phone book? I did it last night. I put my phone number just into a search engine. And guess what? Popped up my name, my address. I tried it with my ex-wife, worked for her. I tried it with my brother and his kids, worked for them too. So let's just forget the nonsense that they don't know who you are. And in fact, this, this leak indeed that Snowden did, it is one of the most significant leaks in U.S. political history, especially when it's combined with the revelations about PRISM uh, and the other programs of massive government surveillance. And the thing is, how do we know that this was significant? By the ferocity of the reaction. Representative Peter King said not only Snowden and whoever linked the PRISM data uh, should be prosecuted, but the reporters should be as well. Attorney General Eric Holder said national security has been damaged. Lin Lindsey Graham said, I hope we follow Mr. Snowden to the ends of the earth to bring him to justice. Isn't that what we said about Osama bin Laden? 
Director of National Intelligence James Clapper said the disclosures risk long-lasting, irreversible harm to our ability to identify the threats facing our nation. And there are others who were, let's just say, even a little blunter. House Speaker John Boehner, Democratic Senator Bill Nelson, and Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein all called this treason. Now remember, these are all people who knew about this, who were in a position to do something about this, and who never did a damn thing. But the thing is, at the same time as we have those rantings, we have some among the punditry yawning uh, and dismissing the whole thing as yesterday's news. Uh, Joe Klein at Time Magazine argued that we pretty much knew all of this stuff already. Walter Pincus at the Washington Post uh, cited a couple of articles uh, from 2006 to 2012 which covered the same general ground as the uh, uh, current revelations. Now all that's true enough, uh, but uh, those articles significantly lack the documentation that the current revelations have, but in fact Pincus could have even gone back a little earlier to 2004. But the thing is, what does that mean then? Are these revelations ho-hum BFD material? Or are they gross treason, a very threat to their, our very existence as a nation? Well, the truth is, it's neither. There are just two different ways of dodging the issue of the government asserting its right to poke, pry, and prod into every facet of our lives. And another way to know how significant this is, another way to know, is how the number of supposed terrorist plots from which we have been saved keeps growing. First it was two, then it was dozens, now it's more than 50 in 20 different countries, as the total keeps getting the Joe McCarthy I have in my hand treatment. However, Senators Ron Wyden and Mark Udall, who have tried repeatedly to raise the alarm about this, declared in a joint statement, quoting, we have not seen any, any evidence showing that the NSA's dragnet collection of Americans' phone records has produced any uniquely valuable intelligence. All of the plots that were mentioned appear to have been identified using other collection methods. In other words, all of these people, up to and including President Hopi Changi himself, who declared this sweeping surveillance a critical tool in protecting the nation, are lying through their teeth. And all they're really trying to do is protect their political butts from the damage to their political power that people actually getting upset about this would cause. And don't you ever, ever forget it. All right, that's it for this week. We'll be back next week. Uh, just my last thing, my weekly reminder. As of June 18th, at least 5,192 Americans have been killed by gunfire since Newtown. 55 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week.